that malaria will move northwards. Climate scare stories cannot be blamed solely on sloppy or biased journalism. According to Professor Reiter, hysterical alarms have been encouraged by the reports of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. On the spread of malaria, the IPCC warns us that Mosquito species that transmit malaria do not usually survive where the mean winter temperature drops below 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. According to Professor Reiter, this is clearly untrue. I was horrified. Uh, to read the second and the third assessment reports because there was so much misinformation without any kind of recourse or virtually without mention of uh, the scientific literature, the truly scientific literature, the literature by specialists in those fields. In a letter to the Wall Street Journal, Professor Frederick Seitz, former president of America's National Academy of Sciences, revealed that IPCC officials had censored the comments of scientists. He said that this report is not the version that was approved by the contributing scientists. At least 15 key sections of the science chapter had been deleted. These included statements like None of the studies cited has shown clear evidence that we can attribute climate changes to increases in greenhouse gases. No study to date has positively attributed all or part of the observed climate changes to man-made causes. Professor Seitz concluded I have never witnessed a more disturbing corruption of the peer review process than the events that led to this IPCC report. In its reply, the IPCC did not deny making these deletions, but it said there was no dishonesty or bias in the report and that uncertainties about the cause of global warming had been included. The changes had been made, it said, in response to comments from governments, individual scientists and non-governmental organizations. When I resigned from the IPCC, I thought that was the end of it. But when I saw the final draft, my name was still there, so I asked for it to be removed. Well, they told me that I had contributed, so it would remain there. So I said, no, I haven't contributed, because they haven't listened to anything I've said. So in the end, it was quite a battle. But finally, I threatened legal action against them, and they removed my name. And I think this happens a great deal. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists. Research relating to man-made global warming is now one of the best-funded areas of science. The US government alone spends more than four billion dollars a year. According to NASA climatologist Roy Spencer, scientists who speak out against man-made global warming have a lot to lose. It's generally harder to get uh, research proposals funded uh, because of the stands that we've taken publicly. And you'll find very few of us that are willing to take a public stand because it does cut into their research funding. It is a common prejudice that scientists who do not agree with the theory of man-made global warming must be being paid by private industry to tell lies. I get it all the time. You must be in the pay of the multinationals. Sadly, like most of the scientists you will talk to, I haven't seen a penny from the multinationals. I'm always accused of being paid by the oil and gas companies. I've never received a nickel from the oil and gas companies. I, I, I joke about it. I wish they would pay me and then I could afford their product. Whenever anybody says that I'm in the pay of an oil company, I say my bank manager would wish. There is almost no private sector investment in climatology, and yet to be involved in any research project which involves an industry grant, no matter how small, can spell ruin to a scientist's reputation. Modern technology fueled by greenhouse gases. Patrick Michaels is professor of environmental sciences at the University of Virginia. He was chair of the Committee on Applied Climatology at the American Meteorological Society, president of the American Association of State Climatologists, the author of three books on meteorology, and an author and reviewer on the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But when he conducted research which was part funded by the coal industry, he found himself among those under attack from climate campaigners. British based corporations are some of the worst climate criminals on the planet. Shell is based in the UK, right here in London. We have the right and the duty to take it back into public ownership, dismantle it, break it up, and send its managers to rehabilitation training. 
As international public policy bears down on industrial emissions of carbon dioxide, the developing world is coming under intense pressure not to develop. Delegates from around the world are flying into Nairobi for a conference sponsored by the UN to talk about global warming. Civil servants, professional NGO campaigners, carbon offset fund managers, environmental journalists and others will discuss every aspect of man-made climate change. From how to promote solar panels in Africa to the relationship between global warming and sexism. The conference lasts 10 days. The number of delegates exceeds 6,000. The billions of dollars invested in climate science means there is a huge constituency of people dependent upon those dollars. And they will want to see that carry forward. It happens in any bureaucracy. Where I live, we have local council, a local council global warming officer. There's a huge um, tail out there of people who have, in one way or another, been recruited to join this particular bandwagon. Anybody who then who stands up and says, hey, wait a minute, let's look at this coolly and rationally and carefully and see actually how much merit, how much uh, this stands up, uh, they will be ostracized. Scientists accustomed to the relative civility and obscurity of academic life suddenly find themselves publicly attacked if they dare to challenge the theory of man-made global warming, vilified by campaign groups and even within their own universities. It's the old English saying, if you stand up in the coconut shy, they're going to throw at you. So I understand that there's going to be some of that, but it, it, it gets pretty difficult and pretty nasty and very personal. And there have been, uh, you know, death threats and all sorts of things. And so I'm not doing it for my health. These days, if you are skeptical about the uh, litany around climate change, you're suddenly like as if you're a Holocaust denier. The environmental movement, really, it is a political activist movement. And they have become hugely influential at a global level. And every politician is aware of that today. Whether you're on the left, in the middle, or the right, you have to pay homage to the environment. In the past month, the global warming campaign has won a great victory. The United States government, once a bastion of resistance, has succumbed. George Bush is now an ally. Western governments have now embraced the need for international agreements to restrain industrial production in the developed and developing world. But at what cost? Paul Driesen is a former environmental campaigner. My big concern with global warming is that the policies being pushed to supposedly prevent global warming are having a disastrous effect on the world's poorest people. Global warming campaigners say it does no harm to be on the safe side. Even if the theory of man-made climate change is wrong, we should impose draconian measures to cut carbon emissions just in case. They call this the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is a very interesting beast. It's basically used to promote a particular agenda and ideology. It's always used in one direction only. It talks about the risks of using a particular technology, fossil fuels, for example, but never about the risks of not using it. It never talks about the benefits of having that technology. So 